Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Million Dollar Media. I'm your host, Max keller and we're doing a little special episode today. Throughout the month of February, leading to the new live-action attempt at Avatar, we are going to be doing a little retrospective, where each video we do this month, uh, we're going to be reviewing each season of the show Avatar The Last Airbender. So we'll have three episodes dedicated to each season. And today we're going to be talking about book one, which is Water which is the first season of the show and the season that pretty much like, well, literally introduced everybody to the idea of uh, Avatar and pretty much set up like this cultural landmark of an awesome, awesome TV show. And with me, I have a pretty packed room. What's up? My name's Chris. Uh, watched Avatar a lot as a kid. Just saying. one of my faves. Okay, well, you know what? Fine. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Fine. Don't want any background information on why we're on here for this episode. They get it. They know why you're here. What else would you be? Shut here? your ginger ass up. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa! I said ginger. Really? I said ginger. YouTube cancel it. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord. All right. Literally. Well, I, I've already talked, so I think I'm gonna go ahead. Hi, name's Adrian. Amen and mean, and I didn't watch this as a kid. Oh. We'll we'll get into that. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Joelle. I've been on a few episodes. Um, and I probably didn't watch this at the same time. I watched it at a later age than most people probably did in this chat, at least. Interesting. Well, now that you all like bring up that idea, we could we can talk about it. Like I watched this at a very young age. I don't think I watched it as it was airing, but I definitely watched a lot of reruns. Like this reran many times as a kid i just had each of the episodes recorded on my tv and i don't think i actually watched any of this show in order like i didn't watch it from like one two three i would probably watch like something in season two then something in season one and then just kind of had to piece it all together and why like where it all fit in yeah that kind of just happened sometimes when you were a kid you know you just watch tv shows just like oh that explains that watching them out of order is kind of fun though Mm-hmm. And that happened with me whenever I'd visit um, some family in Chicago, because at home I never had the channel to watch Avatar, but in Chicago I did. So whenever I had the chance, I was watching Avatar, but completely out of order. You you didn't have Nickelodeon as a kid? No, well it was on Nicktoons. Whenever oh, I yeah. watched, I didn't have the. It was never on Nickelodeon for me. It was always Nicktoons. Huh. Okay. I I watched it mostly on Nicktoons, yeah. Max, you're really showing your age there. I watched it on Nickelodeon, but that was in like 2008, 2009. That's when I watched it. I watched the series in order because I didn't watch it until like the very fledgling days of Netflix. Ooh. It was one of the first things that I would watch with my siblings. Um, so that was probably like 2012. Okay. Oh. No, that's mm-hmm. interesting because not only that's when like Cora was released. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So well, I'll have to pick your brain at that whenever we get to Cora. Okay. Well, <laughs> funny enough, I'm probably the one who's watched it the latest because really? I didn't start watching it until Cora was done. Oh. Cora was done by the time, and it reappeared on Netflix. That's yeah. when I started watching. Oh, God, Adrian, oh, well. I beat you on that. <laughs> oh really? Dang. Eamon, when did you watch it? I technically watched the first two episodes in high school, maybe six years ago, because the I was at a party oh, and shit. My friends there were deeply offended that I never watched any of it. <laughs> As they should be. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I'm kind of offended that it took you that long to watch it. I'm not. And then Hey, you watched the it. Last two years, I believe I watched it on Netflix. Nice. You're the newest fan, okay. and we're glad to have wow. you as a part of the fandom. Uh, I think at the. <laughs> <laughs> now that we kind of like talked about what we, like, how we got into the show, I kind of want to just like do like a brief overview about what the first season entails. I don't want to like go into like each character by character, but we can at least like talk about the main three. Mm-hmm. The villain, and that's it. I mean, maybe if you have any like side characters that you liked in the first season, we could talk about. 
Um, Kyoshi Warriors, cough, cough. Sorry. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Even though I feel like the best Kyoshi Warrior really doesn't come into play. Like, well, she's in it. Well, damn it. Ah, okay. All right. I think we should probably start off by the, the namesake of the show. The, not only in the Avatar, but also the last Airbender part. Uh, little boy Aang. I think he is like the best shonen protagonist but done really well in the american way in that like or at least it's a good adaptation of what a shonen protagonist is in that young full of energy has to learn how to hone his powers tragic backstory no parents um i love that no parents is like a cornerstone of a shonen <laughs> protagonist but here's the thing hold on this brings the, up the argument though is avatar an anime or just an animated tv show animated TV because show. yeah animated tv show it's, animated not, a, TV show. it's Good. not a i bring up shonen in that it's inspired by eastern animation and specifically like anime and stuff but one it's animated by koreans so it's not typical like japanese anime in that sense it's just based off the style um each of the characters of the show are representative of like different Asian cultures, like Tibetan, uh, Chinese, Japanese. Um, I'm trying to think what else is we've seen. Inuit. Inuit, thank you. Mm-hmm. Like, and various... then also, I know Jan also said like Vietnamese or like Southeast Asian with the yeah later on yeah. So mm-hmm. it's not specifically set in like Japan or anything like that. Even though like there's no real like every everybody's kind of based in like uh what their element is so like there's earth kingdom people which are basically more representative like chinese culture firebenders are mostly like japanese imperial era and like the airbenders which we were talking about with a he are mostly based off like tibetan monks or at least like not shaolin monks but I don't know the specific region. If anybody here who's studied more of like Asian culture want to like comment um, on that, I mean, please look Tibet's so Tibet's national link or national religion, I think, is Buddhism. So it probably draws off Buddhist. Mm-hmm. The colors also kind of lean into that. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, that's why I just said about it. You know, I just think he's like the perfect like. He's a great main character. I don't think that they do a lot. Well, I shouldn't say they do. They do a lot of interesting stuff with him in this first season. What I like about the show, I, should, I guess I should say, is that it gets progressively better each season. It just kind of leaves this first season as like, uh, how do I say this? Like, you could see the potential of greatness in this first season, but you're still having to get through a lot of like classic Nickelodeon cartoon problems, in my opinion. In that, like, there's a lot of filler episodes in this first season that are just kind of like, can we, like, get through this? <laughs> yeah, I would say that's fair. Um, but also, this first season particularly highlights the fact that this is a child. He is 12 years old in that this show. True. Yeah, and that's also why, like, I know in one of the episodes of the first season, they were flying around, and Zuko was like, I can't track them down. There's no rhythm to their traveling. Because they're kids who have... Like, Sokka and Katara have never left the Northern Water Tribe, or Southern Water Tribe, sorry. Mm-hmm. And Aang's obviously been frozen for 100 years. They don't know their way around. Like, yeah. I think that's part of the reason why it seems like it's filler. I don't that's think it's fair. necessarily filler, but it's just because they're kids, they're traveling on I, their own for the first time. This filler at least gets you to know the characters more. So, it's filler and then, it, like, you get to live with them a little bit and have fun and understand like who they really are but if you like were to tell me in the grand scheme of how the story goes do you really need this episode maybe not we'll get into one of my least favorite episodes that kind of made me like stop doing a rewatch because i was just like i i don't know if i could get through another episode like this i want to kind of skip to the good stuff (laughs) that's fair like, we'll get into that, Shame. but I know that um, you brought up Sokka and Katara, so I kind of want to get your guys' thoughts on that real quick, then I'll say how one of those characters means a lot to me. Okay, so quick overview of Sokka and Katara are 
kind of like the eldest siblings of the Southern Water Tribe. They yeah. are the oldest kids that we see uh, there. Um, they're about uh, Aang's age. Well, yeah. they're also children, like, born in war. Well, maybe not yes. Aang so much, but, like, Katara and Sokka are, like, we've known nothing but death our entire life. Yeah, especially and, after yeah, their mom. Yeah. And all the waterbenders in their that, tribe. Yeah, and they mentioned earlier is that and Aang as a shonen protagonist doesn't have parents, but that isn't really a traumatic thing. That's just part of his the way his society is structured. The actual trauma of missing one parent is for Katara and Saka. That is also true. There is Monk Gyatso. And I don't think it's specifically airbender tradition for the parent thing. I think it's more avatar tradition and that they have to take the kid away from their parents and have them be trained by like the their mentors yeah or, i can't remember what there's like a secret, masters yeah there's like a secret organization that like goes around with the toys and like tells them like pick these toys and if they pick the toys that each of the avatars put, picked before they have to take yeah. them away from the you're parents. talking about the white lotus although they aren't what? really taken away from the parents because we saw in legend of Korra, Korra obviously knows her parents and she still goes and gets to see them yeah but i don't know maybe it is an airbender thing but I always got the impression that, like, up until that point with, like, Korra. Because, like, keep in mind, like, there's, like, a hundred year gap in Aang being the Avatar. And a lot of that tradition was just lost because what was wiped out. True. Oh, and by the way, I know I should have said this up top. We are going to be talking huge spoilers. Like, so don't be afraid to, like, be coy about things. Like... Just to say it, like we're talk, we are a bunch of Avatar fans talking, li- hopefully being listened to by Avatar fans and for Avatar fans. So this is just a fun little chat discussion slash review of the season. So yeah, I think that season one with Katara and Sokka really does set up their dynamic as siblings. Oh yeah, it's very realistic in that oh. they fight about really stupid stuff sometimes. But they're always going to come back and care about each other and protect each other and that kind of vibe. Sokka is the perfect dumb older brother. And as a dumb older brother, I can relate <laughs> really hard with like all the things that he fucks up on. There is, I think it's the last couple episodes with Princess Yura. The, well, okay, you didn't have to go there initially. <laughs> I got a, quite yeah. a bit of secondhand embarrassment from him. Yeah. Yes. He is one like the main character you get secondhand embarrassment from. Well, yeah. Which feeds into the dumb older brother. Yeah, it's true. But I don't know. I feel like beauty of like having Sokka on the I was gonna say the team is that like he kinda humbles everybody in a way. In that if he was just another person with powers, it would just kinda seem a little bit overkill. Or at least it wouldn't that the stakes wouldn't be there. And what he brings to the team is something that like none of the other ones really have. In that he's always had to be crafty and had to use his head. And even though yes, he does do dumb, stupid stuff, but when it comes down to like the heat of the moment, he is a very skilled like strategist and always wanting to do the right thing. And like he's very brave. He's the first one to take a shot at Zuko. Like think about that. Like. He's, like, the first one in the front line. Keep in mind, he is, like, the only, like, male in his village. So he has to kind of, like, bring up that bravado. Yeah, because I think he was barely just underage to go fighting with the rest of the Southern Water Tribe. Yeah, which is crazy. That's why we see him as, like, one of the only, like, almost adult people there. Yeah. Besides the adult woman. Mm -hmm. Besides Grand Grand. If they had put Grand Grand on the front lines, she would have whooped everyone's ass. I... Yes, she would have. <laughs> <laughs> she can control Sokka and Katara. That's she would have whooped anyone's ass. <laughs> but yeah, like, I don't know. I just love all three of her main leads. Uh, what I will say, Katara in particular has always been, like, one of my favorite, like, characters in media in general. In that, like, she's funny. She's strong. She does have, like, she, she gets her ass kicked, but she can also kick ass more times. Like, she's just badass. But I really like her character in that, like, she brings, like, from a young age, 
she's always very wise to certain situations and that kind of made me like really like appreciate this character and like even at a young age i was always like oh yeah katar is cool and you know like young me was always like oh yeah i can always relate to the guy characters because i'm a guy and i can always relate to this but i would she was the first one to make me think like oh no she is special she's really cool she is so special in fact that when i'm me and my family got a dog we named our first dog katara that's cute yeah she is katara is a very good girl yes i love her very good doggo i expect pictures oh yeah they're pictures on screen <laughs> pictures on screen We've got to get them views. <laughs> Adrian, you've been quiet. Do you have anything to say about like any characters in particular? I think I might have you set up one character that we haven't talked about yet. Oh, um, I'm I'm assuming we're talking about um Zuko. Yes, I thought. Okay. I thought I would give it to you. <laughs> All right, man. I love Zuko. All right. Keep in mind, a... we're talking only about season one Zuko. Yeah, okay. I know. Okay, okay. Just want to no, let you know. I know, I know. He's just spoiled a little brat. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, yes, yeah, season one, Zuko is a... <laughs> oh, God, you learn he has issues on the first time you see him. Well, he's got a fucking scar on his face. <laughs> like, he has daddy issues, which, you know, I can understand looking at Lord Ozai, but, you know. I, he he doesn't need to be so much of a bitch, you know. He he does have Uncle Iroh. Well, technically, he's an absentee father, so. I mean, yeah, but he his whole existence is based off his father oh, and true. trying to gain his approval. So no, <laughs> you are wrong. This this shit. He devoted. You literally learn his devotion in life is to make his father happy and earn his respect. That is his entire purpose that you learn from book one. With Zuko being the way he is, mm -hmm. in comparison to Gaio, it's, it's one of the most likable characters ever. Iroh's best. Yes. I've never met someone who doesn't like Uncle Iroh. Uncle Iroh's a G. Like, I wish I could learn from him. Like, he got that old wisdom. He got that old man wisdom. It's great. Voiced by Mako, who we will talk about. Maybe not in this video, but we'll bring him up in another video. Mm -hmm. Because, damn. Yeah, I feel like it's really interesting that, like, to have a character like Uncle Iroh on the, the antagonist side is a really interesting choice in that he's so likable. He's always saying, like, the thing that's like, nah, yeah, he's right. Like, you should listen to him. It's just an interesting, like, story choice and writing choice to have him on the antagonist side. Because I feel like it's this good balance. Whereas, like, if you didn't have Iroh then Zuko would not be an interesting character because he would just be very one note. But with him mm -hmm. there, it really makes Zuko 10 times more interesting in whenever he fails or succeeds at any certain thing. It's always interesting to see, hear what Iroh has to say about it or we'll get into what my favorite episode of this season is. That episode really like the highlights the antagonist side of things. I was just going to say that to your point, about balance, uh, especially in the first few episodes, we see the goodness in Uncle Iroh and kind of a shadowy side of Sokka in this prejudice and paranoia. Just kind of like a yin-yang thing going on. And to add on to that, the nuance is further developed when you come across Jet in his game. Jet is very Machiavellian in <laughs> his entire persona. Uh, especially in book one, and I can never decide whether or not I like him. I've never really liked him. Like, he just gives fuckboy vibes. Like, I know he's, like, 15, 16, but he gives fuckboy vibes. Like, you are not wrong. Boy. He gave me, like, Peter Pan vibes growing up, and I think that that was part of why I'm like, am I supposed to like him or not? Oh, good message, poor delivery. <laughs> That's what we're getting at. Yeah, pretty much. Also pretty, like, heavy for uh, what is intent for, like, a show mostly yeah, aimed towards kids. kids. Show. Like, hey, kids, sometimes the good guys kill people. Or the bad guys will say that they're good guys mm -hmm. and say that it's for the greater good that they do something without yeah. actually thinking about other alternatives. Yeah. And also that there's not always people, always bad people on the other side of conflict. 
which keep in mind like this show came out like in the er like mid aughts like bro like 2000 something like that which is first episode aired 2005 okay so yeah this like this the war over out in the middle east is still going on and like a lot of kids are like being raised up under like certain ideals of like hey they're the enemy over there it's like i never even thought about that as a kid just like oh yeah like just to teach kids like hey even though yes there's things going on over there and there's some bad people not everybody's bad over there and you shouldn't just like treat quote unquote your enemy as lesser or like you know it's just an interesting thing i never thought about until like discussing it now especially like when this show takes place or like when the show was released yeah and then also sometimes it can show that like well yes the good side is trying to do good they might not always end up with a good thing mm-hmm. like obviously going on like the earth kingdom that's all fucky wucky with you know the wow. king's trying to protect the people but like this is gonna be the most challenging one to review in that it's hard to get across like no this is a really good show it's just that not everything that people rave about is in this first season do you guys want to move into like your favorite episodes of this season because i just mm. season one. or at least mm. moments because I feel like, yeah. for me, my favorite episode is the episode where both teams, it's uh, Team Avatar and Zuko's, like, ship are, like, caught in this storm. And oh. we learn both Aang's backstory and why he ended up in the ice and how Zuko got his scar and how, like, both of these, like, different traumas these characters went through led them to led them to become where they are right now as characters and why they do what they do like why Aang is very worried about going forward with wanting to be the avatar and like he just wants to be a kid and like him running away from home and ending up in the ice and how now that is just affecting him going forward and how like Zuko is just like trying to get his father's approval through any means necessary and it's just it's such a well-written episode and it's always stood out to me as a kid even now as an adult i really appreciate this episode just how well written it is it's also the first time we see the hint of uh lightning bending which yeah there's a moment yeah yeah, there's a moment i think yeah he like redirects a lightning bolt from hitting the ship and they play it off as a joke but like keep in mind if you were to watch that for the first time you're like well what the fuck did he just do like how do you do that (laughs) i don't know it's just i have always loved that episode it's just very well written and the moment where ang has to like go out into the storm to save Sokka and the fishermen and have to like relive that trauma over again it's so well done yeah, to your point um, about Aang, that episode really showcased how his kind of fatal flaw as part of an airbender thing, almost culturally, is avoidance mm-hmm. um, and yes. him learning how to navigate that mm-hmm. and deal with conflict. Yeah, And that was something I really admired as a kid. Yes. Oh my God, you're so right. I didn't think about that. Um, and kind of to that point, I think my favorite episode of the season um is uh the king of omashu uh yeah so, yeah yes. <laughs> so get yes. this awesome yes. secondary king. character uh king boomy hell yeah he's my favorite uh he is absolutely insane um and absolutely enjoys it uh-huh. um and he's an earthbender um and okay we're we are doing spoilers yeah king boomy knew ang before Aang was frozen in ice. King mm-hmm. Boomy is that old, and he is just a <laughs> super powerful earthbender who's gone insane and just makes jokes all the time. He's uh-huh. the goofiest guy, um, but I mean, he also has this wisdom uh, that comes across as almost cryptic, but you know that mm-hmm. there's something to it. I don't know. I just love Boomy. I also one other thing i want to add he's also very threatening like keep in mind he he imprisons katara and Sokka in like what at the time was pretty much like this 
unbreakable rock. Crystal. Cr- well, yeah, crystal that was just eating eating away at them, or at least like consuming them. And then it's ultimately like, oh, it's smacking. Just eat it. <laughs> I don't think we've ever yeah. actually seen another Earthbender later on in the series use crystals like that. Mm-hmm. Well, so man true. has his own subset. Well, interesting. You also have to. It's not really a, I guess, a useful bending in combat because it is rock candy, and they they just say that yeah, you could just eat this. So it's not like actual stone that will like you can. Actually I know, hurt but the like fact that. that he fucking made it. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> he trapped them in candy. That is, true. and that is the funniest. Are you kidding me? Max, Max, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I don't think if half my body was encased in rock candy, I could eat all that rock candy before it completely covered and ate me. True. But you do solve world hunger. Yeah, but you also give everyone diabetes. (laughs) Some man just required this sacrifice. Some of you may (laughs) die. (laughs) Some choices require the strongest wills. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a great really. episode. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Okay. Uh, Eamon, do you have a favorite episode? Or at least, like, favorite moment of season one? I originally thought of Boomy, but another one, when looking through the list, that reminds me of my brothers is the Great Divide with the Johns and the Gunjins. But it's interesting that you bring up that episode. I'd also like to mention that the Zhang and Ganjin right sound very similar to me the song for dirty and ganjin for clean in chinese Amanda. oh really yeah oh that's cool well i mean avatar's never been subtle about like what characters are named after but you yeah know, i i never thought of it like that but that's really cool thank you but why does this episode stick out to you besides that i guess the one thing that's reminding me of my brothers who haven't murdered each other Ah, good. <laughs> That's good to but hear. The, one thing that is peculiar to me is at the end of it, and stops a lot of their, their internal bickering. A lot of their bickering comes from something that happened 100 years ago. Oh, yeah. And Aang just makes up a white lie to get them to stop fight, hating each other as much. Mm-hmm. The basic message of that entire episode was sometimes you can solve conflict by lying. I mean... I mean, you know, it's like a century-old conflict solved by a white lie. Yeah, no one has to die. People are happy now. I feel like this is a real Watchmen argument. (laughs) (laughs) And that, like, I don't know. It's like, should we tell the people that we... uh, What happened, or should we just let it slide and let things just go back to the way that it was and the horrible way that it was and i also think like aiming to your point and to also what joelle brought up earlier it really shows how aim loves or is always wanting to find the path of like less violence he's a pacifist hell i think he's a vegetarian i just think that it it's more to show how aim will do literally anything do not cause violence, have people die, and if it involves having to do a cheeky white lie, to I he'll do it. It is an odd message to give kids, but I think it's more like a character based thing. Path of least resistance. Path of thank you. Great way to put it. No, I also think like from what I've heard amongst the Avatar community, that's the one episode that a lot of people don't like, actually. I'm not saying that you're wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just finding it interesting that that is your favorite episode. I can see why people don't like it. And I can see why people do like it. Seeing grown adults bicker at each other like little children. Yeah. What are you it talking about? Like this is a really fictional funny. show. It's a show about like kids and fire and water. It has no <laughs> implications to the real world at all. Especially today. <laughs> no idea what you're talking show? about. Yeah. As- Political commentary? Yeah. Inconceivable. <laughs> Inconceivable. <laughs> I couldn't think of it. anything. Avatar gone woke. Oh Please my no. god. <laughs> let's not go down this path. Nah, let's piss people off. Um, just kidding. Uh, 
Man, say that's the first time you're actively trying to piss people off. I like pissing off the right people. Live action Avatar was a good movie. <laughs> Alright, Adrian, just fucking start. <laughs> okay. Um, well, two episodes came to mind. One before it was when Aang started learning firebending. Oh, and yeah. realized how dangerous it is mm-hmm. and how destructive it is compared to his beliefs. Yeah. You know, another internal conflict that he has to go through, just learning firebending and also plays into him not wanting to become the Avatar. It also plays into the idea that the Avatars are forced to learn the elements in a certain order. Yeah. You know, going from pacifist uh, airbending all the way to firebending, that's not how he's supposed to learn them. Yeah. Because obviously, one's pacifist, one's actively trying to hurt people. Mm-hmm. It's one of the harder ones for like airbenders to get used to. That's mm-hmm. why they have the order. So my favorite episode, it's actually kind of a tie all right. between episode three and episode four. Because episode four, you have the Kyoshi Warriors. I fucking love the Kyoshi Warriors. Sokka finally learns that, like, hey, women can be strong, too, even mm-hmm. if they're not benders. You know, mm-hmm. he kind of gets that kick in the ass. But yes, also, Suki. Yes, I fucking love Suki. She's a fucking queen. But episode three, more focusing on, like, the Avatar gang, they go to the Southern Air Temple where Aang grew up and, like, He's coming to terms with the fact that his people were genocided, and it's very sad and really dark. But honestly, I kind of like it. it. Like, it would teach kids, like, how to kind of deal with grief. Mm-hmm. And also, it kind of shows, like, yeah, we think the airbenders were good, but also, like, how Monkey Atsu's body in a room full of firebenders' bodies, which means Monkey Atsu probably fucking killed all those firebenders. <laughs> true, true. Because airbending is really fucking scary. Yes. The implications of what you can do with airbending. Uh, we obviously, as the viewers, when it's animated, we see the air being pushed around. You know, it's animated for us. Mm-hmm. The animators even said they did that just for us. If they, like, the live action and shit, you don't see the air. Like, those people that they were fighting would not see the air. It just kind of shows how terrifying the air nomads could have been if they wanted to. But then also the funniness of the Kyoshi Warriors. Sokka learning that, like, you know, maybe, you know, treating people equally, even women, has its ups. <laughs> really? Shocker. Never would have fucking guessed. It was? Oh my god, Adrian. <laughs> I should put, like, a link up to the Barbie episode. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Like, any indications, like, the little in- interested, recommended for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love the Kyoshi Warriors. They are fucking awesome. Love the makeup. They are. I love their style of fighting, the fans. That's always really cool to me. They were always really cool. And as a kid, I was like, damn, those are some really cool girls. Um, I'm not going to get into that. Oh, God, if I really get it. You know what? I'm, I'm going to move on because the more I think about this, I'm like, oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> Max? <laughs> I don't have a problem. Really? No. Max? After all the years I've known you, yeah, you totally don't have a problem. <laughs> Max, you can save it for therapy. You all don't right. have to share it with YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> no! He's worse things on YouTube, he's fine. I need, I need you know, views, damn it. Max, this isn't this the is, worst thing. This, this is, is not the video. worst thing I've said. As long as you don't oh, turn this video into an intervention, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Oh, don't worry. This is... <laughs> Yeah, I just really like those two episodes. I also like that the Kyoshi Warriors has some, you know, more comedic shit. Yeah. After the seriousness. And then, obviously, right after both those episodes, because they both are somewhat serious, you have King of Omashu. That's true. <laughs> just instant character relief. All great episodes, but I think... Okay, so the whole season is just them trying to, like, go the other oh, polar ice cap. And and go to the northern water tribe to get trained by the masters of water bending, and at the end of the season they finally make it, and it's this beautiful, beautiful like kingdom made out of ice, and it's got some problems. Definitely has its own <coughs> sexist prop. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah. 
just a just link, a few, you know. Link to Barbie up here. Um. <laughs> uh, but Katara handles that really well too. Love that episode as well. Oh. Um, can we just take a moment of appreciation that Sokka's girlfriend turned into the moon? Because it's it's just iconic. Hold on, this might be a bit of a stretch, but like some places say or instead of saying like i love you or like a confession or something people say like the moon looks beautiful Mm -hmm. his girlfriend literally turned into the moon yeah isn't that mean doesn't that mean like she now becomes technically the confession i don't know where the fuck i'm going with this i forgot i forgot what the which is also the japanese word for moon is ski ski and to be fair i did learn about this through a a silent voice (laughs) we I know, but I find that really interesting, like how close those words are together, and how in Sokka's like dating life, <laughs> <laughs> he just likes one particular word. <laughs> I mean, that character uh, Yue, I think her name is Yue. Yeah, yeah, Yue. Mm-hmm. I really like her. You really, in like a short amount of episodes that you get to know her, you really enjoy the time you have with her. I think it's interesting to see her contrasted with characters like Katara and Aang. Aang because of like her sense of duty and Katara with like how she is also navigating this kind of line between um, what she wants and what her people kind of need her to be. Mm -hmm. So I kind of appreciate that parallel, but maybe that's just me. No, yeah, I love that character. Other things I gotta say is like a like great like grand scope action. Like you don't really get that in a lot of like cartoons. You clearly see where the battle lines are drawn, where everybody's at. It's all really well staged and directed. And I greatly appreciate just I don't know, I feel like the those last few episodes are really well directed. And for you Star Wars nerds out there, they are directed by Dave Filoni. All right, let's wrap this up. Yeah, I know. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We got to talk about your least favorite episode. How about we wrap up the finale first? Cause we yeah, still wrap talk the about finale, it. then we yeah. can get into our worst. I think my favorite part of this finale is, honestly, how batshit insane it gets at the very end. Of just like, um, giant fish. Uh, giant fish water. Um, giant kaiju. Ooh, giant kaiju. kaiju. <laughs> Godzilla attack. Honestly, basically. Yeah, it's kind it, of funny yeah. when you think about the Fire Nation represents Japan. Oh, yeah! <laughs> you know how history repeats itself? Yeah. It's Godzilla, but we can't say Godzilla because of copyright rules. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll still run oh like it's God. Godzilla. But it's- <laughs> oh, yeah. Great reference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. But yeah, still, I love that they just get ridiculous. Also, I just want to point out, I feel like this first season delves with more of the spirit stuff, more than any of the other seasons do. More evenly, I would say, definitely. Because there is the thing with, like, chakras in book three. That's true. Yeah. Also, also each book, they kind of go over, like, the founders or, like, the teachers of the bending styles, and it just so happens that the moon and ocean and water spirits were the ones who taught the water benders and obviously that's being threatened you know as ang's going on his journey to learn the mm-hmm. different bending styles he actually meets like the te- the original teachers of the bender i guess what i meant is like compared to the other two finales this one just goes really really creative and crazy with the overall spirits and like how they involve with things. Like this also has the face stealer in this episode. Um, this first season has oh, that panda, right. the panda that turns into the uh, uh, that monster because it's trying to protect the forest. Like there's a lot more really cool spirits in this first season. And as the other ones go on, I understand why they kind of moved away from it a little bit and decided to you know go more into like the metaphysical and the Fire Nation taking over everything and all that but i really do like how creative and weird this season is that's what i'll say this season has above the other ones and just how like really cool the spirits are yeah Mm because like i'm trying to think back like season two they didn't talk about much the only thing i can think of is that 
owl and the great library oh yeah the great library yeah. that's the only spirit i think we see in book two and the tree mm-hmm. the tree is its own kind of thing yeah i don't think it's a own. spirit but the, the swamp and the tree is its own thing yeah but then again that's just a tree and this you got that this again you got that panda you got the code the face stealer you got the two yeah. koi fish with, that leads into the giant koi fish kaiju thingy. Like, there's a lot more going on. And I kind yeah. of appreciated that. And, I mean, Korra delves into that way more. Even more. Even more. But, I don't know. I just wanted to bring that up. It was something I noticed. I think that this one, we see the biggest leaps in character development. Yeah. And later we see more nuance come into their characters. Yeah. I feel like the writing in this first season was definitely trying to be, was a bit more broad. And like, again, as you said, like there's like characters do take wild leaps and like arcs and stuff like that. Yeah. Like Katara stealing a waterbending school. Yeah. But I also (laughs) think that like, that's the show trying to learn how far can we push the envelope? And then they just said, fuck it we're just gonna go for it with the second and third season and that's what i kind of respect about this first season in that like if you were to watch this for the first time there's nothing like this on tv or at least for like kids shows there was nothing that was taking its time like this maybe batman the animated series but nothing in the early aughts that's fair they were much more focused on short bursts of very engaging material yeah rather than building up these characters or yeah and an ongoing mythology with lore cultural influences yeah because like i'm looking at the nick and nick like nicktoons n- list n- 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 sorry but like i'm looking at the list and i'm not seeing anything that had that like danny phantom had a lot of lore and stuff and, like, yeah but never consistent though it was never a straight line with Danny Phantom. He had some episodes that were here and there, but never like three or four episodes that tie up together. That's right. Avatar is a straight line. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this one up, Adrian. This is a, I love this finale. Welcome. Oh, I also want to bring up one of my favorite parts is you learned that Uncle Iroh is a threat. Yes. Yes. He is definitely that. You like... think, like, just from previous episodes, he's just an old uncle iroh no he's a fucking threat this man has committed war crimes he's called the dragon of the west because he supposedly killed the last dragon he threatened his own tribe in order to keep peace yeah you guys wanted to know my least favorite episode i think my least favorite episode is the one where they go to the one village and this one girl has this massive massive crush on aim oh yeah i could not get through that the second time i guess it wasn't my humor but i found it really cringy was that one the fortune teller i think it was, I think it was. yeah it was kind of funny because Sokka, but also Sokka has that like same running gag in other ones where it's basically Sokka is logic versus whatever suspicion people are following wherever they are oh yeah well that's what I, I think that's the only thing about this episode that I kind of like. <laughs> that's that, like, I love Sokka whenever he just has to be, like, the only voice of reason. It's just funny to see him just, like, try to prove, like, the the obvious. It's like in geometry when you have to do proofs. Yes. And prove that the thing is a triangle. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that level of logic. You have the unfortunate memory. <laughs> What's the theme of today's episode? Trauma. Trauma. If the fortune teller didn't, she predicted that the volcano wouldn't destroy the village. Yes. So, but by the letter of her word, it didn't actually destroy the village because of Aang. It just. Well, oh God. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Technically, <laughs> he's right. He's right. Him. He's not wrong. He's not wrong, but. Because, like, all the fortune tellers right. shit ends up coming true. Yeah, but, but he's not wrong, but. Fuck you, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, hey, hey, don't talk to Adrian hate. like that. Don't talk I know, to no, no, like I love him. He's his boss. He can say whatever he wants. No, no, no. That's the secret police you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I only say that because, like, you make my brain hurt with that logic. I, I realized right away, and it makes the episode even more annoying. Yeah. 
it's ironically in the book one named water it is the is water wet discussion in one episode water is wet <laughs> this that would be the best thing to comment below this episode i don't want to hear anyone's thought about avatar i just want to know what you think about is water, water wet is water wet all I want to know. All I want to know. Okay, but here, here's the thing, though. Oh, we'll never know because the feeling of wetness, humans don't actually have the ability to feel water. We just feel the pressure from it. We can't actually feel water. Yeah. We feel the coolness of it. We have temperature receptors. Yeah, we have the temperature receptors, but we can't actually, like, feel it. Anyways, uh, so my <laughs> least favorite episode is uh, the water moving master because we literally are brought back to, like, episode four where we're just going back to the message of anti-sexism. That That's is the whole thing. True. It feels a little bit pointless to me. I can see how Katara might need to force her way into a position where she can learn more beyond what she already has picked up because mm -hmm. she is self-taught and there's always a disadvantage to that. Mm -hmm. But still, it yeah. felt like it was just wasting time biding its time for the season finale. True. Yeah, I could see that. I Yeah, it was a bit of a waste of time, but also it kind of shows that, obviously we kind of see throughout the entire Avatar world that there is some sexism towards women. Like, you see it with Toph in book two. Yeah. Like, how she's treated in her family. Uh-huh. Not just for blind, but also <laughs> kidding, her dog. Kidding. It's not a fucking spoiler. I'm kidding, Dude, I'm this kidding, show's I'm been kidding, over, out for over a decade and a half. <laughs> I will say there's one other point I want to bring up that kind of breaks this episode's logic or like message is that the only way that like she gets accepted is through nepotism pretty much because yeah. the only way that he recognizes that who she is is because of her necklace. It's it's her necklace or something that it's reminds her necklace. Her, yeah, it's her necklace Grand that Grand. reminds Haku that oh yeah, that's this is Grand Grand's this granddaughter. Is Grand Grand's granddaughter. And like, all right, fine, I'll train you. I just realized that, like, huh, that, that's kind of a weird message. Like, yeah, fight the power. We also need, like, a family. You, you need some connections. <laughs> like, ma marry, I mean, <laughs> marry into wealth, ladies. I mean, I guess it worked out in the end. I mean... Because both Katara and uh, Aang got the training they needed. And then, yeah. obviously, later on, Katara grows even stronger past yeah. that point. Well, I know, like... In Korra, like, the Southern Water Tribe has, like, greatly expanded. Oh, god, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot going on there. Like, she... I like the episode because I like Katara's character, and I love, like, just seeing her just be badass and, like, really strong and up front. But, yeah, the, the whole message just kind of break down when, so, like, you see how she wins. But, yeah, thank you for bringing this up, Joel. Like, of course. Like, Always here to throw rocks at things. Yes. Does anybody else have, like, a worst episode before we wrap this up? Jet. I thought you... Okay. <laughs> no, I don't like Jet. Do you not like... Jet's an asshole. I don't like the person. Like, I don't really like the people in his crew, <laughs> either. Like, I get it, they're fucking kids, but, like, they're assholes. They're the kind of kids you would want to punt. You gonna punt Pipsqueak, huh? Yes. You gonna punt him? Unfortunately, I don't think I can pump, punt Pipsqueak, but, like... I had to fucking punt as many as I could. Adrian, do you have a worst episode of season one? Uh, or like your least favorite? Uh, I should say worst. Probably be Fortune Teller. Same yeah. reasons that we already said? Yeah, when you reminded me of that episode and the idea of it, yeah, that was pretty fucking stupid. Yeah. I... Everyone hates the Fortune Teller. Yep. <laughs> it sounds like an awesome rock band. Sorry. Oh, does anyone remember the fucking Winter Solstice episodes? I'm looking at them, and I'm just like, I don't remember this happening. I don't either now that you say it. He tricked the, the fire stages into thinking that they already opened the door to get into the... That's right. It does have a really cool yeah. moment, though, with... Uh, Avatar like, Roku. He, thank you, where he, like, embodies Aang and, like, tells them all, like, fuck you. <laughs> it is this cool. Is, this is the Avatar. That's a really cool moment. Otherwise, I really don't remember much about those episodes. I also loved uh, that episode because it built up a lot of the historical connection that the last Avatar had to the Fire Nation and how it's True. personal to the Avatar. True. All right. I think that's all I we really have to say about the first book or season. I cannot wait till Toph. 
I don't know if this is going to be the same crew going forward. Maybe we'll add some. Maybe we'll have some. Some people might not be here, but I definitely want to try to keep this uh, group, this our own little team avatar, if you will. Um, the gang. The gang. Thank Shut you. Shut up. I had to. That's literally what they're called. Gang. No, they're team avatar. Team avatar, gang. Dude, if you, trust me, if you Google G-A-A-N-G, you will see Team Avatar because they're also called Gaang. Something in the show or something that the fans did? I think it's, yeah, it's a fan fans nickname. Did. It's definitely a fan. fan There's nickname. no way. It's better than Team Avatar, respectfully. Gaang is Fine. definitely better. But yeah, they, we'll try to like continue keeping this gang together. This is going to be, this is episode one of Avatar Month. We're going to be doing the next couple seasons and leading up to the first season of the live action show. Can't wait for that. Hopefully it's good because I think that the first season mostly covers what we talked about today. And I know it wasn't like a very coherent review, but this is just like a retrospective of us shooting shit. All right. Does everybody want to say their name one more time before we leave? Well, I'm Chris yet again. I'm Adrian. I'm Joelle. And then we'll share and mean the yeah, uh, thank you all for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. Please follow us on our Patreon. We are trying to... Uh, the more people we can get to subscribe to our Patreon, the more cool things we can do with the channel in the future. Um, please subscribe. Over there, you can listen to all of our... Or most, I should say. You can listen to most of our episodes uncut. So you could probably even listen to this episode uncut over there. And yeah, um, hope you all enjoyed the video, and I hope you have a good day. Bye.